Zoom. All right. So good evening. Um, we are going to do the following tonight. Uh, we're going to read Parak Gimel, chapter three. I'm going to read and translate the whole thing. It's a short Parak. I think it's like 13 Sukim. It is something like that. Let's see. 13 Sukim. I'm going to read and translate. And also, I will raise a couple of questions along the way. Then we're going to go back and do it in depth. Generally speaking, um, I know, Sue, you weren't necessarily with us the, during that time period, but Mark was, that when we have been learning over the years, we do Navi, generally what I like to do is to read through the chapter completely, raise questions, then go back and review and go into depth. Um, sometimes I'll go, you know, Pasuk by Pasuk, as we did more or less in the Parakabet, because it's very long, but we're going to go into Gimel, the old, the old way that we've been doing it. So here we go. Read Pasuk uh, Perik Gimel, starting with Pasuk Al. By Yigaha Chodesh Hashvi'i, the seventh month arrived. That's the month of Tishrei. Uvenei Yisrael. Now remember, they, they, one thing we kind of forgot: the first, the, the second Perik was all these names of people, and all the people went on Aliyah. So from Perik Bet to Perik Gimel, they got to Israel. Remember, the end of the chapter of Perik Bet, they settled in the lands. Many, most of them, in the area. Of the, Greater Jerusalem area, some a little bit further north, but for the most part in the area of, of Mamlechet Yehuda, they were settled for the most part. And um, now what's going to happen? Remember, they came with a goal. The goal was to come to the land, according to Koresh, given the edict was to go and build the Beit HaMikdash. Unfortunately, as we know, things don't always go as planned for the Jewish people. Example, if you look at the beginning of Sefer Bamidbar, you have uh, all these accounting of B'nai Israel, you have them giving their jobs, literally their marching orders, and then of course it all falls apart because their plan was to go into the land of Israel. And what are they going to do? Fight, conquer the land, build Beit HaMikdash. But no, every year they make the same mistake. There's the Chet HaMiraglim, there's the sin of the spies, and as a result the, um, the Jews don't go in and they stuck in the desert for 40 years. Here, uh, it's not going to be a 40-year process, but what does happen is they do get to the land of Israel. They do get to the land of Israel. And... Um, Some uh, people can't find you. They've got the wrong link. A link for two Bishvat or something. Oh, also, really? the last two... So, in okay. the WhatsApp, was the right link. Ah, hold I on went, just second. went back further until I got this link and got to you. Okay, thanks. Let me let me just go right now then. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oops. Let me see if this is it. Link, paste. Let's see. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. You're welcome. Okay, so let's give it. Uh, I was wondering where everyone was. They were talking to each other, saying, "What's what with this link?" I see. Danny called me a couple of times. So, okay, let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's give it a second. All right. I'm going to put everyone on mute for right now, and I will apologize to all those who come in now, and I'll start again. Hey. Okay. So sorry about that. Um, I, I uh, sent out uh, the wrong link. Um, I was wondering why it was just me talking to myself almost the first couple minutes. So <laughs> let's, uh, we're going to start again. Um, what we're going to be reading in a minute, we're going to look at Parak Gimel, chapter three. I'm going to read through it, translate, bring up some questions, and go back and pick up some of the information. Um, at the end of Parak Bet, the Jews um, who went to Aliyah, came to Israel. They settled in the various cities. We already saw that at the end of the last chapter on their various cities. And now remember, let's not lose sight of the goal. The goal, of course, is that they're going to be building the Beit HaMikdash. Well, we know, even if you don't, didn't read this, the book itself before, but it's part of the introduction, is it doesn't happen right away. It's a process that takes goes over a period of years. We will see that. But right now, the first step towards the building of the Beit HaMikdash occurs. Let's take a look now. Perak Gimel, starting with Pasuk Aleph again. 
I say again, because I started before I realized I had the wrong um, link that was sent out. So let's try this again. The seventh month arrived. Again, that's the month of Tishrei. <clears throat> the Jews had settled in their various cities. Now, after having settled in those cities, they all assembled as one into the city of Jerusalem. Obviously, we're going to come back to this Ki'ish Echad statement. I don't see if it's obvious, but as we're going to come back to it. Pasuk Bet. Vayakom Yeshua ben Yotadak ve'echav ha'kohanim, Yeshua ben Yotadak and his son, his brothers, the other kohanim, Uzu Bavel ben Shaltiel ve'echav. Of these people all got together. What did they do? Vayivnu et Mizbach Eloha Yisrael. They built the Mizbeach, or the altar of Hashem, to do what? Leha'alot alav olot. To bring upon it korbanot. Kakatuv b'torat Moshe Yishalokim, as it's written in the book of, of the Torah. I thought they're coming to build the Beit HaMikdash. So what are they doing building up the Mizbeach? Number three, Gimel. Vayachinu ha-Mizbeach ha-Mechonotav. They set up the, the Mizbeach on its proper location, on its correct site. Because they were afraid of the people of the land. And they then brought korbanot, both morning and evening. What is they afraid of? And by the way, if you look back in Pasuk Bet, you'll notice it says, et mizbach Hashem. They built the Mizbeach. And in Pasuk Gimel, the very next one says, Vayachinu. They set it up. What's the difference between building and setting up? Pasuk Dalet, number four. Vayasu et chag sukot kakatuv. They kept the holiday of Sukkot as it is written, meaning in the Torah. Ve'olat yom biyom memispar, and the proper amount of korbanot every day. Kemishpat var yom biyomo, as was required on every day of the Chag. That one I'll just mention briefly. I'm sure many of you know that during the week of Sukkot, they were bringing what was called the Shivim Pare Hachag, the 70 bulls that were brought on behalf of the 70 nations of the world that were brought during the week of Sukkot. Now, remember, there's no Beit HaMikdash yet. All there is, literally the only thing there is, is a Mizbeach. And after that, then they started bringing regular Korbanot and the Korban for the Rosh Chodesh, and all to the other various Moadim in holidays, and anyone who wanted to bring a free will korban uh, offering on the Mizbeach. So, so far in the first five sukim, what we've seen is that there is this return, number one, we know from the end of the last chapter, there's a return to Zion, right, which is called Shivat Zion, the, the Jews have returned to Zion. They settled parts of the land. They now come at the beginning of Tishrei, or at some point in Tishrei, early on, they uh, come in from the various cities. Again, mostly we're in the greater Yerushalayim area. They come into the city and they build or they reestablish or they set up the Mizbeach. No Beit HaMikdash, no walls, no anything else yet. And they bring the Korbanot for Sukkot. And what about Sukkot? What do they do for Sukkot itself? It doesn't tell us yet. Vav, number six. From the first day of the seventh month, they started to bring korbanot. But yet the Beit HaMikdash, the foundation for the Beit HaMikdash had yet to be lain. But the first day of the Chodesh HaShvi'i is Rosh Hashanah. It's not Sukkot. Zayin. They paid those who were like the to, 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 to chotzvim or hewers of stone. And the craftsmen, they paid them with money. And to the people from Tzidon and, and, and Tzor, which is basically Lebanon, they paid them with, with uh, food and drink and oil. And what were they paying them for? To bring cedar wood from Lebanon, from Lebanon, to the port, to the sea of Yaffa, Yaffo. And then, as was authorized by the king of Persia, meaning Koresh. It's a very strange pasuk as well. Right? 
they're, they're, it's all of a sudden, it's telling us that they're importing goods. For those of you who remember Sefer Melachim, you'll remember that we learned in Sefer Melachim, Aleph, Perek, uh, Zion, Vav, Zion, when we talked about the um, importing of goods because the Jews, Jews not only did not have the materials that they needed, they didn't have the craftsmen that were needed. So they imported workers uh, from Lebanon. And a similar idea is happening over here. And, but it's also mentioning that this has been authorized by the king of Persia, king of Koresh. But we already know that. What's the purpose of mentioning that again? And then the second year, when they arrived back to the house of Asha, meaning they came back on this mission to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash in the second year after they returned, in the second month, so these names, all these people, along with all those who return from the captivity to, to Yerushalayim, they, they set up, they appointed the Levi'im, who are 20 years and above, to start, now you'll see different com, uh, com, um, translations. It could be to supervise or it could mean to sing. Okay, like for example, Lam Natseach Al Hashminit. Okay, number Tet, nine. Vayamod Yeshua Bana Vechav Kadmiel, Uvana Bene Yuda Kechad. Yeshua and his sons and his brothers, Kadmiel and his sons and the sons of Yuda, uh, all got together. They were appointed to be in charge of those who were going to work in the Beit HaMikdash. Now, again, it could be that they were singing songs. That's probably the more proper translation. We're going to see that tonight or next week. Um, so since these are all Levi'im, the assumption is not only were they supervising, but they were also singing. What were they singing? We're going to see. Why were they singing? We will see. Yud. The builders laid the foundation for the Beit HaMikdash. And the Kohanim who were wearing their special Kohen clothing um, came with their um, trumpets. Um, and the, and the, and the sons of Levi uh, and B'nai Asaf came with their uh, symbols, C-Y-M-B-A-L, symbols, Lehalel um, Hashem, to give praise to Hashem, Ayyadei David Melech Yisrael, through or by way of, or as, or as David Melech Yisrael had established. Yud Aleph. Vayanu v'halel v'odot l'Hashem kito, ki l'olam chazdo al Yisrael. They sang songs. And what were the songs? It was basically, Hodu l'Hashem kito, one side, was the refrain, was the response, rather. And they blew, uh, 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 there was a lot of shouting, and they, maybe they blew, they blew shofarot, it's possible, they do the, the trumpets, with, along with the singing of Hallel, because the foundation for the Beit HaMikdash had been laid down. Many of the Kohanim and Levi'im and the heads of the tribes and the old people, the older people who had seen the first Beit HaMikdash, the original Beit HaMikdash, Zabayit Be'enehem. This was, the, this, that they had seen, this, the, the first Beit HaMikdash with their eyes. Bochim Bekol Gadol. They were crying a great cry. Rabim Bitura Besimcha Alarim Kol. And uh, the, many of the others were shouting just like with tremendous joy uh, as, as loudly as they could. The, so obviously this requires some explanation to why were they crying and why were the people joyous? Yud Gimel, the last pasuk. The people were unable to differentiate the different shouts of joy. The kol am for the people who were crying. Because the people were shouting a great shout. And the sound was heard from very far away. So it's a bit, again, we'll get to the pasuk. What does it mean? What was, was it one was drowning out the other? What was it exactly going on? 
So there is a lot in this particular parak. I think it's though it's important to note something very, very important here. This was a historic event. This is a historic event because the Bnei Yisrael had a Beit HaMikdash for X amount of years. Let's not even go into numbers tonight. X amount of years, they had a Beit HaMikdash and it was destroyed. We know that there was a Nevoah that talked about 70 years of when, how long they'd be in the Galut. And during that time period, after that time period, they would come back from Galut and they would build Beit HaMikdash. They're given permission by Koresh, king of Persia, to return to the land of Israel, Perak Aleph and Perak Bet with the Jews, getting the permission, gathering their stuff, traveling, coming to Israel. And in this Perak, they take the first two steps. The first step is that they build a Mizbeach. And upon that Mizbeach, they bring Korbanot specifically for Sukkot. The second step is they start to lay the foundation of the Beit HaMikdash. There's a lot of fanfare. There's a lot of joy. There's a lot of celebration. There's the singing of Hallel. Again, whatever that meant at, at that moment. And there's also sadness. Sadness is, of course, the fact is, is borne out by those people who had seen the first Beit HaMikdash. They saw what it could be. They saw what it was. They saw the splendor. And now they see a much smaller version of the Beit HaMikdash that is going to be built. It's not yet built. But just what they can envision and the way that's being uh, attempted, they already see where, the, where this is headed. And it's not what they had originally it's uh, dreamed of. Um, you know, we always talk about, oh, we can't wait for the third Beit HaMikdash to be built. And the truth is that's going to be the fourth Beit HaMikdash because eventually what happens after this Beit HaMikdash is built, then along comes Herod, Hordus, Herod the builder, Herod the crazy, whichever way you want to look at him. And he doesn't feel that this Beit HaMikdash does service. Uh, that's a, a, a Tarte Mashma. And he builds a much more magnificent Beit HaMikdash so that pretty much any time you see models of the Beit HaMikdash, archeological remnants of the Beit HaMikdash, of that area that we that are parts that are found, um, it's the second Beit HaMikdash built by Herod. So that was really the third one in a sense, when you think about it, there's just the second, it was Beit HaMikdash 2.2, I guess, or 2.1. Okay, so let's go back now, we're gonna go back to the beginning of the chapter and we're gonna look at a couple of things um, that we, I think will help us to um, get, get into this whole topic here. Now, you know, you could read this and just move on to the next chapter. Very fine, they built a Mizbeach, they started to build the foundation of Beit HaMikdash, Shalom Yisrael, move on. But I think it's important for us to get a little bit of perspective here because this is, like I say, this is historic, this is monumental. It begs the question also that I wanted, actually before we even do the screen share, it begs the question of we as Jews, celebrate a lot of things in our, in our calendar. We celebrate, um, you know, in modern times, we celebrate Yom Atzmaut. In, in, from ancient times, we celebrate, obviously, the Chagim that are mandated by the Torah. We celebrate Purim, we celebrate Hanukkah. We, we, have, we, we have reasons to, to be joyous during the course of the year. But it's interesting that there is no holiday that specifically celebrates the building of the Beit HaMikdash. What we do have is a holiday that celebrates the rededication of the Beit HaMikdash, i.e. Hanukkah, after it was defiled, after there's all kinds of problems with the Beit HaMikdash. <clears throat> and one of the explanations I heard, one I thought it was actually quite beautiful. If it's up to me, by the way, to establish holidays for Am Yisrael, I actually wrote an article once that there's too much mourning in our calendar, not enough celebration. And I, I, I suggested three or four new holidays and three or four less fast days. Three less fast days, actually. I would, uh, for various reasons. If you're interested in the article, let me know afterwards and I'll send you the link. Um, but one of the holidays I would have established would have been the, the date upon which um, the first Beit HaMikdash was built. Um, the day that was the, the par basically Parakhet of, of Melachim Aleph, where the Beit HaMikdash is, is first put into use by Shlomo HaMelech and the Tvila he has there. In any case, why is it then we don't have such a holiday, but we do have the rededication? <clears throat> so I heard the following I thought, and I'm changing the, the mashal just a little bit to make it more current. Imagine a person's working on their doctoral thesis, and they have worked on it for two years, three years, done tremendous research, have all their information that they have. It's an unbelievable new 
idea in that particular field that they're writing their, their thesis on. And the day before they're going to present and do what's called the defense of their thesis, the computer upon which it has been written crashes and the backup crashes and they have nothing. They have zero. The excitement and the exuberance and the thrill of all this work and all the sweat and tears that went into doing this is gone. But it's an unbelievable project. And now he has to, or she has to start from scratch and they, they really believe in it. They could do is say, you know what, throw up their arms and say, it's just not meant to be, forget it, it's over, I'm done. Let's just find something else or I'm not even gonna bother about my doctor. The other approach is no, it's so worthwhile. We need to go back, I need to start over. I need to re-interview and do all the, the, the research again and start from scratch and move it up again. What's more difficult to do? The building of the Beit HaMikdash or seeing so much of it, I'm not talking about the re rebuilding of it, not just the rededication after the time everything was, was mitame and everything was, was originally impure and they couldn't use certain things. Forget the whole questions of why they should, they could have been able to use it anyways. The idea of getting re-motivated and rededicating and starting again is the whole concept of the Hanukkah is a triumph of, of, the, of the, the soul, the, 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 the communal Jewish soul over really complete despair. So here you have a similar idea. <clears throat> you have the Jews who now have been given this permission to come back to the land of Israel to rebuild something that the elder statesmen had seen originally when they were younger. And the young people are, you know, this is like thrilling. And there's this difference, this almost tension between the two groups as to this is a, it's good. Everyone knows it's good, but what it could have been or what it is. Again, we'll deal with that at the end of the chapter. But what we want to talk about now is a couple, of, a couple of things of introduction to this chapter. We're going to look at a couple of different um, commentaries tonight. Some will be from the Datso Freeman, and others will not. Okay, this is the, the, the idea about the building of the Beit HaMikdash from the uh, ruins uh, that were there. Okay, so the Gemara tells us <clears throat> that, that is what should be an obvious question at the beginning of this chapter. Why are they building this Mizbech? I mean, don't you need to have the Beit HaMikdash and then you build the, Beit, the Mizbech that goes inside of it or outside of it and then you build that altar and then you bring Korban out? So he said the decision was made that even before they would build the actual Beit HaMikdash, that they would establish a Mizbech upon which to bring Korban out. The Gemara gave two reasons why this was done. And, and they, they basically, they, after the two reasons, they, they boiled it down to one main reason. And it is, Now the Gemara doesn't, I, I, there's sometimes I teach, especially teenagers that have zero, and I mean, absolutely no concept of the Jewish history timeline. They would ask me if I was about to read this, they would say, oh, so the Gemara quoted the Rambam. Okay, so don't make that mistake, okay? They said that the, the, this is the Dat Sofrim quoting the Rambam and saying that he's basically saying what the Gemara says, which is, Now, I know that some of you are going to be very um, um, encouraged by this statement. So hang on. All the Korbanot can be brought. Even though the Beit HaMikdash is not even yet built. And in the area of the Azara, you could eat the holy, the, mean the korbanot. Even if the Beit Hamikdash lays in ruins, that the, we know that the the, the kedusha of the location of Har Habayit is in perpetuity. This is said to those who build the Beit Hamikdash through one of the Nevi'im. The another opinion was that there was another way that allowed them to establish this, this Mizbeach. Question is, by the way, how did they know where to do it? So Gemara tells us that three Nevi'im went up with them to uh, Yerushalayim, and each one had a different um, um, role in, de in helping determine what was to be built, where it was to be built, how it was to be built. I'm not going to get into the Gemara right now, but it says 
um, in, in Pasuk Bet, I'm going to go to that for a second, then we're going to go back to Ki'i Shechad. Pasuk Bet, it says, Vayakum Yeshua ben Yotzadak, etc. Vayakum mashma'u b'chol makom. Every time it says Vayakum, it means he's darzut, hit chazkut. It means like starting to do something quickly, diligently, and with chizuk. Things that would get in the way of your doing it. For those of you who listen to my or come to my Mesilat Yisharim class, or even if you know Mesilat Yisharim, you know that one of the first chapters is called, it has to do with, with Zrizut. And we said that one of the things that in the way is Zrizut, of doing a mitzvah the proper way, is you get all kinds of things that get in your way. And usually you are the one that gets in the way of doing the mitzvah. So it says, Vayakom here, to tell us that there are things that, that could have prevented them from starting. So they, they went and they took the bull by the horn, so to speak. Yeshua, who was meant to become the first coin gadol, which we actually saw in the Perak Bet when we were talking about him, as a, a, an inheritance from his family. Ushara Koanim and the rest of the nation of the uh, the Koanim, Imishet Sarikha Yaliot Yoresha Melucha. They strengthen themselves to do this great action. This was considered to be the building of this Mizbeach, was considered to be the first step towards the building of the Beit HaMikdash. Now, it's, in my mind, in the average person's mind, when you read Parak Aleph, when Koresh gives permission for the Jews to go to Israel to build the Beit HaMikdash, what would be the natural procedure or process? They'd go, they'd set up shop, they'd get the plans, they would sit down and they would, through the Nevi'im, explain to them how to build it, where to build it exactly, and start building it. I, I don't think I would have thought of the idea that, oh no, they're going to build a Mizbeach first. It's possible that this decision was made by the Nevi'im even before the group in Pasuk Aleph says they all came to Yerushalayim. But it's only mentioned here um, in like in a chronological order. Okay, very nice. Now, what I want to show you is something that kind of, for a double reason I want to show this to you. I mentioned last week or two weeks ago, Project 929. Some of you are aware of this or familiar with it. Project 929, again, was established by Rabbi Benny Lau, Shlita, among others. There was an idea that because most people are aware of Tanakh, the Chamisha Chumshei Torah, maybe Yehoshua, Shoftim, Shmuel, Melachim, and then kind of a little bit of a residual, okay, they made a little, little Yermiyahu, a little Cheskel, <clears throat> but no one, I shouldn't say no one, Chas many people don't go from beginning to end from Tanakh, came up with this brilliant idea that similar to Daf Yomi, that every day, with the exception of Shabbat, because that's kind of a review, that they would read one parak a day of Tanakh. And that after 929 prakim are read, um, would be, <clears throat> we'll have finished reading all of Tanakh. And it grew, it blossomed to the point where they have both in Hebrew and in English, amazing websites that not only give you just the parak and the commentary, but also many, many, there's a, each one has a, 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 a video shiur of the, of the, uh, of the parak. It has commentaries, it has articles for every single parak in Tanakh. It's magnificent. I'm also mentioning it because this week, I think it's Thursday, it starts again. I committed myself to start up with it uh, on Thursday with the beginning of Sefer Breshit, Parak Aleph, if I can find where it is. Ha. Um, but I'm mentioning that because I, I want to show you an example of what they do, uh, because it, it, in our parak, this, this author, Josh Blackner, I don't personally know him, wrote an article called Like One Nation. If you look again at Pasuk Aleph, it says, <clears throat> That all the people who were there now gathered as one person in Yerushalayim. So hopefully, one of the first things you thought of when you heard those words was that it says um, that B'nai Yisrael in Pashat Yito, which we just read uh, a little over a week ago, that B'nai Yisrael camped opposite the mountain, meaning Har Sinai, and Rashi's famous line, as one person with one heart. Um, but the words themselves, don't over there appear in the Torah. <clears throat> 
But the words ki'ishachad do appear throughout Tanakh in multiple places and almost always in a negative connotation. I'm not going to read through his article completely, just to show you a couple examples. He tells he the words ki'ishachad appear when, when um, in the story of the Meraglim, he tells us in the story of Gid'on, where again, the word ki'ishachad comes up in a very negative connotation. And, it's, and then for those of you familiar with the story of Pilegish Begiva, the horrific story uh, with Sheva bin Yamin, again appears the word, again in Sefer Shmuel, which we, we learned in the story of Yavesh Gilad, um, where there is a, again, the words ki'ishachad are used and at least two or three other times. He lists all these places and he says, what is different here is the idea that, that it's a, a positive. Whereas almost every other time it uses that phrase in Tanakh, it's a negative. And again, you say, wait a minute, it says it by Matan Torah. No, it doesn't say it. Rashi uses the words there um, in, a, in a quote, but it doesn't appear in Matan Torah. But it does appear almost everywhere else. And it does, when it says like one person, it was almost always something negative. And here it's important to note, he says that at the beginning of the rebuilding the Beit HaMikdash, that the first thing was, was it was done with one, as they were doing with one person. They all had one particular goal. It wasn't that they were coming with different perspectives of, oh, I'm going to have glory and one's going to be the leader. And I'm going to, they all have one mind. Now, there's another thing I think it's important to note. Tomorrow night is the first night of uh, Adar Ishon. And had this been a regular year, not, what's called a Shanap Shuta, it would be two weeks till um, Purim. It's important well, to note that- the last night of Shvat, not the first night of Adar Ishon. It's the first, it's the first night of first Rosh Hashanah, it's the last Shvat. night of, of Shvat. So the, um, the um, Purim is something that's very important to think to note that I think ties in very nicely here as well. When Haman talks to Achashverosh, he says to Achashverosh, that there's this nation that's all spread out and they're so weird and they have all these different rules and customs and it's just, it's not worth having them around. We should write them out. What is what happens? He is playing on a very true statement that he says, Yeshno Amechad Mefozar Umeforad. We unfortunately are a very fractious people. Not only are we physically spread out, but we're also divided into groups, into camps. And unfortunately, many times not too often getting along with each other. What happens when Esther finds her voice? Remember that in the beginning of the Megillah, the hero, so to speak, the hero is Mordechai, and he's the one running the show until Esther finds her voice. Esther finds her voice, and then she's the one running the show. It's why it's also called Megillah to Esther for other reasons. But what happens? What does she say when she wants to decide to make this fast for three days prior to going to Ahasuerosh for the first time? She says, Lech kenoset kol hayudim. What does it just mean? Literally means gather all the Jews together and tell them, tell them we have to have a fast for three days. But what's the word she uses? Knos. She wants them all to gather, both also in the physical sense, but also in the spiritual sense to unify and come together. So that's the antidote to the that they're all fractious and split apart. She says, what do you do to bring Geula? You come together. That's the only thing that's going to help. So over here, they're ki'ishachad. Doesn't say belevechad, they're ki'ishachad. And that's that first pasuk. Um, let's take a look at pasuk bet. Notice that I said that it says in pasuk bet, vayivnu et mizbach elokei Israel. And pasuk gimel says vayachinu. Let's take a look now. Okay, let's make this a little smaller. In this pasuk, meaning pasuk bed, it says the word binia, the word, the language of building. Later, the next pasuk, they prepared. Why? There are two things in one. There were certain parts of the mizbech that still existed that could be uh, go through shikum. It could be they could be rehab, so to speak from their, their, their destroyed state, and to be rebuilt from new, anew. And other parts needed complete 
uh, redesign, meaning there were parts there that they actually could use and they were actually able to use them and build on them. But there were other parts that needed to be completely re re rebuilt from scratch. And so that took two different um, verbs to explain that uh, between two different psukim. And what is it they built? Mizbach Elokei Yisrael. It's an unusual way statement, right? The, the, the altar of Hashem, of his, the God of Israel. The Torah refers to this particular Mizbeach as the Mizbach Ha'ula, not Mizbeach Ha'ula, Mizbach Ha'ula. The altar of, of the sacrifice, of the burnt offering. That that Mizbeach was meant, was, was specifically meant first and foremost for Korban Ola. Again, those are the, the burnt, burnt um, offerings and not for a Chatat, which was a sin offering. It's called this, not, because, not having to do with the korbanot, but rather to express the intention of those building it. Notice what he says here. Yes, it was Mizbach HaOla, but they called it here the Mizbach Elokei Yisrael for a purpose of telling us what was in their heart. What was this idea they were Ki'ish Echad? That they wanted to use it to get closer to Hashem and that Hashem should come closer to Am Yisrael. As we will see, that it was, of course, still connected to the idea of being a Korban, of bringing Korban, Korbanot Ola. Now, this is the mm, Malbim. Malbim? I should have written it down. I forgot. I think it was Malbim. It says as follows. What does it mean? If you take a look, <clears throat> again, that's Pasuk Gimel. It was built on its foundation. It was rebuilt in order to bring upon it korbanot or sacrifices. Now, it says in the um, Pasuk, let's look at Pasuk Gimel again before we continue with this commentary. They rebuilt the Mizbeach on its foundation, on its, on its, on its part, on its machon. They were afraid of the people. Who are they afraid of? The, the people there. And then they brought the Korbanot Ola, and one Ola in the morning and one in the evening. So let's look at this commentary. What did they build it for? To bring upon it Korbanot. They were afraid of the nations that were there. That they shouldn't cause them problems and start to badmouth them to the king. And they built the Mizbeach upon it to bring these korbanot. In order that they, the other nations, the people that they were in, that were in occupying Israel at the time, should hear and understand that what they were doing was being done with the approval of the king. And therefore, and they would therefore cease to try to prevent them or get in their way of building the Beit HaMikdash. Meaning, what was it that they were hurrying up to do? To build something like that, which was obviously being used for a religious event. They were concerned that if they would drag their feet and what are these Jews doing here, that maybe they would have a problem uh, before they even start. So the fact that they hurried up and they got to it right away was to, it, as we, the expression we use nowadays, facts on the ground. They established facts on the ground and those facts were to say, we would never have done this without the express permission of the king. And therefore they prevented themselves from getting into trouble with the king or with the people rather. Now, what happens here is something that um, is hard for us to wrap our heads around. Maybe not. Maybe it's not so hard. Take the average Jew in Chutz Laaretz. I say Chutz Laaretz specifically because here it's kind of hard to miss the fact that there's a holiday going on when there's a holiday because it's all, even if a person is not religious and they don't, they don't celebrate Sukkot or or Rosh Hashanah, whatever it may be, it's, it's, in, it's everywhere. Take the average Jew living in the United States and ask a person who has very little in the way or some Jewish education, maybe a, a, a Hebrew school education, 
Um, maybe they had it before their bar mitzvah, now they're in their 40s, and they asked them, what is Tisha B'Av? Ask them, what is Shavuot? Generally speaking, they're not going to know what it is. But you take among the religious people or people who have a good religious background and education, and even if they no longer practice, but they still learned and they knew and maybe practiced at one time, you ask them those things, they're going to generally know. What's happening over here is incredible. These are actually, a, this is actually a renewal of the keeping of Chagim in the land of Israel. Why is it incredible? Because if you read the text here, it sounds like, okay, they now they, they bring the Korbanot and they're have, keeping Chagasukot. Okay, but the, 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 the truth of the matter is that there is a disparity between what happens here and how it's told us in the book of Nehemiah. So let's take a look. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to do it. It's going to take me too long. Um, I will leave you with this cliffhanger. Not everything is as it seems. Right here, it sounds like, you know, they were keeping Torah, mitzvot, and they're keeping Chagim and Bavel, and they just kind of now migrated now to Israel. And here in Israel, they're going to bring Korbanot, and they brought the Shivim Parei HaChag. But again, the, the perspective of what was actually happening as it's seen in Sefer Nehemiah, and as we'll see Bezrat Hashem next week, is a very different story. We'll have to see that. So in the meantime, I will wish you all a Shavua Tov, a Chodesh Tov this week, Bezrat Hashem. And uh, all goes well. Next Sunday night, we will continue. Bezrat uh, Hashem, same time and same link. I'll send out the correct one again this, this week. Bezrat Hashem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Night. Night. Lala Tov.